the downfall of our economy, we are to hold, uphold our promises that we make. And this is, the, if we look at that vow of the Nazarite, this is what God looks at as far as what we are to do to uphold a vow to him. Now, we know that Samuel and Samson were both born Nazarites. But according to Acts 18.18, 18, Paul took the vow of the Nazarite. And if you want to look it up later, he actually says that in the place he was in, he cut his hair for he had taken a vow. And then a few verses later, he actually is very adamant about having to partake in the next feast. He has to go back to Jerusalem. There is no delay in him going back to Jerusalem. And the reason for that, I believe, is because his hair had to be offered before the Lord inside of the temple. I don't believe that his head had to be shaved within the temple itself. But when he cut his hair, he had an offering that was due to God. And he was taking his hair back to Jerusalem to make his offering. Wow. That's, uh, that's the best that I could tell that doesn't really go deeply into that necessarily, but that's my best guess. Why he was so uh, very concerned about making it back to Jerusalem. It's, there's rumor, or people say, that John the Baptist had taken the Nazarite vow. There's no place in Scripture that he had cut his hair. There's also no place in Scripture that says he drank wine. It did specify what he ate and drank while he was in the wilderness. So people will take that and say, okay, he was a Nazarite. It could be. Some people say that Yeshua took a Nazarite vow, uh, supported by Matthew 26, 29, Mark 14, 25, and Luke 22, 18, which Yeshua said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. They also support this based upon Revelation 1.14 that says his head, on his head was hair white like wool, or was his head and hair were white like wool and white as snow. Notice it says head and hair were white. But we know later on in the scripture that his skin was bronze. So I dug into that a little bit, and the translation is actually treaks uh, for hair which ties to a Greek word named, uh, a Greek word, kome, which means long locks. So they've taken those two scenarios. He says he won't drink of the fruit of the vine again, and the next time you see him, he's got long hair. He's got long white locks of hair. So they take that and say, okay, he made a Nazarite vow. Misty asked me last night, or this morning, when I told her about this, she said, uh, does that mean he's going to shave his head in the new kingdom? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know, but it, it would, you know, anything could happen. But the importance is not whether or not Yeshua or John made the Nazarite vow. I believe that the Nazarite vow was strictly a guideline to follow. God wanted people to see the severity of making that vow. When, he, when a vow was made in his name, a promise made in his name, this is how you uphold that promise. You want to be righteous before me. You want to be upstanding before me. This is what you have to do in your promise. When your promise is repaid, cut your hair. You can drink and eat whatever you want to. But until your promise is fulfilled, and you promise something in my name, then this is how you handle the situation until your vow is complete whatever that vow might be. If we look at Matthew, in Matthew chapter 5, Yeshua in verse 33 says, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. I thought that that was interesting how he phrased that, that you cannot make one, you shall not swear on your head, 
because you cannot make one hair white or black. But his head is a different story. He has taken his promise upon his own head. The writer in Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews, explains this a little more clearly. Uh, the best translation I found was from the Complete Jewish Bible. For when God made his promise to Abraham, he swore an oath to do what he had promised. And since there was no one greater than himself for him to swear by, he swore by himself and said, I will certainly bless you and I will certainly give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham saw the promise fulfilled. Now people swear oaths by someone greater than themselves and confirm oaths by uh, confirm by an oath pulls to an end to all disputes. Therefore, when God wanted to demonstrate still more convincingly an unchangeable character of his intention to those who were to receive what he had promised, he added an oath to that promise. So that through two unchangeable things, in neither of which God could lie, he would have fled, God could not lie, we who have fled to take a form to take a form, hold to the hope set before us, would be strongly encouraged. So, in other words, God is telling us that Abraham, he made, a, he made that covenant to Abraham, and God is not a man that he should lie. He made a promise to Abraham, and Abraham's promise still stands today. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read the scripture where he made this promise to Abraham, he passed in between the dead carcasses of those animals. And Abraham passed in between, or Abraham passed in between the carcasses of the animals, and you had the torch and the cauldron pass between, which is symbolic of Yeshua and the Spirit making covenant with Abraham. So until the death, which we know will never happen, until the death of God, that covenant stands. The promise he made to Abraham will stand until both parties have met their demise. God is eternal, he is everlasting, he is never going to die, and that oath, that agreement will stand Amen. until the end of all. Amen. Amen. Good word. Now, Yeshua... If we look at Yeshua's statement, which we read in chapter 5, in Matthew chapter 5, that isn't the first time that that's actually stated. If you go to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, it says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Yeshua refers to swearing an oath, and in Hebrew, that word is Shava. Shava means to seven oneself. Now, sometimes, sometimes in the word, we'll see words like Shava, or Shava. <laughs> We'll see words like Shava, which are an indicator in Hebrew. Its definition doesn't make sense without the reference of something else. When you go to the root word, and there are three words that have these same three Hebrew consonants, and it comes to the word Sheva. Sheva is the number seven. But Sheva is more than just a number in Hebrew. In the morning process, it's referred to as sitting Shiva. You sit seven. You sit seven days in morning. Uh, there's a lot of different applications to the number seven. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you go through the scriptures and you look up seven, you will find countless hundreds upon hundreds of times that the seven was used. 